Hello, and welcome everyone to our first Quaver PLC. My name is Erica Adkins. I am the Acting Director of Implementation here at Quaver Ed. Each month, we will bring you relevant dialogue with educational leaders and subject matter experts. Together, we'll create an opportunity for you to engage in meaningful professional learning. We want to build collaboration between educators across the nation. I am excited to introduce you all to our first Quaver PLC guest speaker, Dr. Kathy Presnell. Dr. Presnell began her career in education teaching third grade in Chester County, Tennessee. A former Tennessee Teacher of the Year, Dr. Presnell has served as an ambassador for public education across the nation. She's currently focused on growing literacy efforts in her home state. She received her bachelor's degree from the University of Mississippi, her master's degree in reading specialist endorsement from the University of Tennessee at Martin, and her doctorate in learning organizations and strategic change from Lipscomb University. Dr. Presnell, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. I'm excited to be here. Let's jump right in. What do you love about your job? Um, I think when I when I think about my role right now, so I'm currently serving as the director of literacy for grades three through six in my district. I get that literacy part of it, which I absolutely love. So we're digging into some really great children's literature and doing some complex thinking. Also get to get into classrooms on a daily basis and work directly with teachers. So we work to deepen our content knowledge, refine our pedagogy. When I think about what I'm really passionate about in my role, I get to help with our teacher advisory council. So it's a group of teachers, we come together, um, they offer advisory to our director of schools, but I also get to help them learn how to advocate for things that are important to them and develop their teacher voice. And so um, I think those are just the absolute favorite parts of my job and it just kind of feeds all those things I'm super passionate about in education. Kathy, what are the major challenges that teachers are facing this school year? You know, when I talk with teachers and how they're feeling about the start of the school year, I'm hearing a lot of external pressures. So they're really feeling a lot of um, pressure from what our student outcomes look like. How do we help kids recover? Maybe some opportunities for learning that were lost during the pandemic. And not only that, but how do we accelerate their learning? Uh, we know we expected to see a bit of a downturn in student outcomes, but teachers are really feeling the pressure on how do we do that. And they're also, I think, internalizing some of that as well, because when you're in the classroom and your kids are there in front of you, and you know you want to help meet their needs, but maybe there are learning gaps you haven't seen before, or there are certain skills that they typically have brought with them to the first year that they haven't this year. How do you help them um, fill those gaps, meet the grade level expectations, and then do it for 20 or 40 or 60 kids or however many you teach during a day? So they're feeling a lot of that. Um, they're also feeling a lot of pressure from students' social emotional learning needs. So. Um, are they coming to us being able to communicate well and get along and just contribute to a really healthy environment, maybe in ways that we've missed out on because of the pandemic? And then really, when I talk with teachers, one of the things we talk about is it's important to remember that coming out of these last two to three years, everybody has had trauma. Our teachers have experienced it. Our students have, whether it's the loss of a loved one's, the loss of an opportunity to be in front of a teacher, the loss of relationships in a classroom. So when I hear teachers talk about not just the challenges of starting a school year period, but what are the challenges of starting this school year, those are the things I'm really hearing them talk about. Kathy, you mentioned that building relationships with students is very important. What are some strategies that teachers can use to build relationships with their students this year? I love that question because sometimes we say build relationships, but you never talk about, okay, what's the thing that I do to build the relationship? One thing I love to do is try to really get to know every student and find one thing you honestly like about that student. One of the wonderful things about working with kids is like they can spot a fake a mile away, right? So it's finding like genuinely what is it that I love about this student? What do they like? What are they interested in? What's important to them? Which takes me to my second idea, which is something called 360 degree data. So it comes from Jennifer Gonzalez, who runs Cult of Pedagogy. And so what she does is she keeps almost this like spherical, if we think about it, you know, as an idea, data on her kids of like, what are they interested in? What is their home life like? What are they super proud of? What are the accomplishments? What are their goals maybe that they're working toward? And so she just goes in and updates that every once in a while, but it really helps her to deeply know her students. And so when you deeply know them, you're gonna be more likely to develop a relationship. And then my third idea is around thinking about ways we can release ownership 
of the learning in my classroom to my kids. A couple of ways I love to do that. One is student-led conferences, which if you've never tried it, it was just a game changer for me in my classroom. But when kids know that like, I'm going to be the one sharing my learning with my parents or my families that come in, I'm gonna be the one sharing, this is my goal, this is what I've been working on, this is my portfolio of work. Um, that really helps to develop a really good relationship with kids because you're really working with them over time to curate artifacts about their learning. And the second strategy I love that's kind of in that bucket around student ownership is administering student surveys. So when I was in the classroom at the end of each unit, I would give my third graders a survey. What was your favorite part? What was the hardest thing? As a teacher, what do you wish I had done differently? And when they saw that I really regarded them as intellectual equals, like we are partners in learning together, it forged some relationships that were really impactful in my classroom. You've mentioned some educational strategies. What are some challenges that teachers sometimes run into when implementing those strategies? You know, some of the most common challenges I see when we implement a strategy, one is how do I make it work for all or at least most of my kids? Everybody's got different needs, different uh, ways of learning and engaging with the content. So that's one challenge teachers face is just how do I differentiate this for 20 or 40 or 60 different personalities? Another challenge they sometimes face is how do I know? that the strategy is working. I mean, I'm a big fan of finding kind of what I call micro data, which is just did it work, yes or no, today? And then how can I track that over time? But just knowing, is this strategy worth my time and worth my effort, I think is another challenge. And then a third one, I think, happens before we get into the classroom with the strategy, and that's around what is the purpose of it? Um, it's really easy to get in the classroom and like do the thing because it's a fun idea or it's a glitzy, glittery new idea that I want to try out. But going back to what's the purpose of this? How is it moving my kids one step closer to what I need them to do at the end of this unit or the end of this year is hard and that takes some planning on the front end. So those are really the three kind of key things that teachers tend to struggle with when we think about taking a strategy into the classroom in the day-to-day. -day. Speaking of improving, mm -hmm. let's discuss professional learning for teachers. How can districts make professional learning more meaningful? I love that question because I love professional learning in our district. And I go back to when I finish up a professional learning session, I ask a standard set of questions of my teachers and I learned a lot from it. So when I think about how can we improve or how can we make sure we're really offering great professional learning for our teachers, I go to first, is the content actionable? So is it something that I can either immediately take back to my classroom does it come from our curriculum? So is it something that's embedded in like, this is, as a teacher, what I'm picking up and using day to day? Um, and, or is it moving my thinking? Um, I don't want to get caught in the trap of, I need to go teach a trick or a strategy and we go do a thing without thinking about, are there mindset shifts that we also want to help folks make? Um, but thinking about content is important. Um, is it relevant? So is it going to help me get better at teaching the kids in my classroom today with the expectations that are on us as far as district assessments, state assessments? So is it relevant to my practice and my kids? Um, and then I think that third piece is like, is it organized in a way that helps me quickly absorb the content and understand it well and then take it back to my classroom and use it? And then I would say the third piece for districts is, are you listening to your teachers about how your professional learning is going? How effective is it for them? Um, I love to hear from teachers what went well today that we should keep. I think that's an important question to ask. And then what should we change so that we can improve? I um, mean, I think those are incredibly important questions to ask teachers. If you do it anonymously, they will be very transparent with you. But I've never gotten feedback from a teacher on professional learning that I've given that did not help me get better. So when I think about it as districts, what can we do really well? It's making sure the content is timely, it's actionable, it's relevant, and then we're taking what we hear from teachers in that and we're doing it to get better ourselves. My implementation team here at Quaver Ed works with districts across the nation. We've been hearing a lot lately about the need for mental health supports for teachers. When we look at what's happening to our teacher pipeline, it's never been good, definitely not good right now. Um, we see that as a state when we see, you know, record number of teachers who are electing to, to choose a different profession. And I'll just tell you anecdotally, I've seen that day in and day out over the past few years. Um, teaching has never been an easy profession. 
Um, but definitely the pandemic and the other pressures teachers are experiencing, um, you can just sometimes walk into a classroom and and I'll make eye contact with the teacher and you just kind of know what they're feeling and it's really, it's really hard. And so a lot of teachers will say, I'm taking work home. I don't feel like I've got good work-life balance. I'm struggling to be fully present with my family. And I think it's always maybe been a struggle, but boy, has it really come to the forefront the past couple of years. Sure. Thank you so much. What can teachers be doing to ensure their own well-being? I struggle with that question sometimes a little bit because I feel like we've got a couple of ends of the spectrum when we talk about teachers' well-being. We have this Rah, rah, let's get a crumble cookie and have a jeans day and we're going to be great. Um, and on the other end, we don't want to be huddled under the desk eating M&Ms while our kids are as specials, right? So it's like, how do we find that balance of like, what is what does it truly mean to take care of myself as a teacher? I'll tell you a couple of things that I'm, I'm noticing that I think are really good trends. One is around teachers moving away from this idea of like, I'm going to achieve this ideal work-life balance. And I think maybe the pandemic has made us question just in general, what does it mean to lead a well-lived life? And so when I think about that, it's not how do I make my life fit around my work? It's just like, how is work simply a part of my life? And so it's not so much balance, but it's like, how do I make these puzzle pieces maybe fit together in a different way? Um, And so I'm also hearing teachers talk about boundaries in a different way. And it's not this idea of, I'm telling you, my contract hours are done at three. So I'm out the door and I'm leaving what I used to call the cart of shame. I used to take the cart of shame home. It was the cart of papers that went home and came back and like nothing ever changed in the cart. Um, And it's not so much, I'm just gonna, I'm I'm just calling it quits, but it's more of, I am gonna set a boundary and I'm gonna say, I'm gonna work as hard as I possibly can within this time, but then I'm gonna go home and I'm going to um, engage in a, in a healthy hobby and I'm gonna be really present for my family and I'm going to make sure that I am nourished mind, body, and soul. And so it's this idea of, it's not the, the self-care with the cookie and you know the quiet candle. It is, I think, sometimes a reordering and a restructuring of what work means and what work life balance means that, I'm really excited about, but I think we're all really still navigating what does it mean to practice self-care. But I think when when we get beyond the quick fix or the try to to the surface fix to like what does it really mean to maybe change the way we think about these things, when when I see teachers who are who are getting really good at doing these things, I'm seeing them be a little more whole and healthy and and secure in their place in the in the classroom. Yeah, that's great. So what can school districts and local communities do to help in that effort? I think the most important thing we can do is encourage people to talk positively about our teachers, Um, whether we're at home with our own children, whether we are on social media, whether we are at the ballpark, um, having positive conversations about honoring teaching, honoring that craft and what folks are putting into it, I think is huge. Um, when I think about what districts can do, I'll also think about how do we value what we're doing daily during those school hours to make sure that anything we ask of teachers is the absolute highest and best use of their time. Um, when I am in the classroom and I have got my 45-minute daily break and I'm taking my kids to their special area, really that's 35 minutes. I got to take five minutes to get them, five minutes to pick them up. It doesn't account for emails and returning phone calls and maybe a bit of, I'm just going to have a breather. And so making sure those 35 minutes, like there is nothing better I could do with my time, I think is a huge piece of what districts can do to make sure we're supporting teachers and their work-life balance. And then I always go back to the idea of the plates are full um, and they're spinning. And so the question goes to, if I'm going to add something onto it, I have to take something off. So when I talk with teachers about, you know, what do we want to do differently this year? Sometimes they're like, we want to add this and this and this. And so my rule of thumb is, is for every two things we add, we're going to take something off. So let's talk about what that's going to be. Making really hard and important decisions about what we're asking folks to do daily in our schools, I think is, is a really important way our district can support our teachers. So a lot of building trust with our teachers. 
What can companies like Quaver Ed do to support this? Uh, when I think about companies that are supporting teachers and giving them great content-rich materials, I think there are a couple of things we can do. One is to give them high-quality materials that we know we can trust, that are research-based, um, that it's a place folks know that they can turn to for really, really great content. When teachers ask me, you know, how can I simplify my life this year, I say, curate a really small list of folks you can turn to over and over and over and really focus on them. So making sure that companies are putting out great content, I think, is one thing. A second thing is making sure that you're putting it out in ways that give teachers lots of flexibility in how they pick it up and how they use it. So I'll tell you, when I was in the classroom, I was a single mom of three. It was really important that I was able to have access at home, have access at school, have access after school hours so that I could get on at a time that was really good for my family. And also making sure that if there are printables that need to go with it, if there's maybe a video I wanna go watch, that there are a lot of ancillary supports that help me pick those materials up and use them really well right out of the gate in my classroom. Thank you so much for that feedback. That's great. Let's shift into the next topic, why teaching matters. Will you share with us, what is your why? Oh, I love this question. So I'm going to have to tell you about my Mrs. Helmick. When I was a senior in high school, well, when I was in high school, I was in the creative writing class from ninth through 12th grade, and we got a new teacher uh, my senior year, and she was tough. We read book. We read like the Fountainhead. We read some tough stuff. Um, we wrote like never before, and she would mark it up with a red pen, top to bottom. Um, it was the hardest work I'd ever done. But when Mrs. Helmick told you it was good, you knew it was good. And so we really bonded that year. Um, I like to say still that any writing I've ever done of worth came from Mrs. Helmick. Um, but after graduation, we kind of, of course, went our separate ways. Um, I went on to teach and to serve as Tennessee Teacher of the Year. She went on to become the president of the Mississippi Education Association. And so it was about 25 years later on a snowy night in Washington, D.C. at an education gala that somebody tapped me on my shoulder and said, there's somebody here you need to see. And it was my Mrs. Helmick. And we both just burst out crying and had not seen each other in 25 years when I think about teaching and I think about the why behind it, it's because we get to be that for 20 or 40 or 60 kids every year, and we impact their life forever. So it's just the challenges and the joys that are inherent in that work are why I absolutely love it. It sounds like she had a major impact on your life, like teachers all over the world are impacting kids every day. Absolutely. Absolutely. So how do teachers stay motivated day in and day out to do this work? I think there are a couple of things when, as a teacher when I think about how do I stay motivated. One is I'm going to tune in to those other teachers around me that kind of feed my teacher heart and my teacher mind. And sometimes they're in your building and sometimes they're not. Um, but, you know, we all know the story of the marigolds, right? And those are the teachers who are not necessarily toxically positive, but are real, and they see the best in kids, and they see the best in the profession, and you know them when you see them. Um, you kind of know, they kind of draw you in. And so I would say find those teachers, uh, because I have them in my life, and they motivate me every single time. And then I would say tap into the children. Um, even today, even though I'm not in a classroom of my own every day, if I'm having a bad day, you're going to be able to find me in a classroom somewhere because the kids, 100% of the time, motivate me to be better. Um, when I was in my own classroom, one thing I would do is I would really listen to the feedback the kids are giving me. And um, I'll never forget, there was one lesson I was doing, and I had a student teacher in my classroom. And so we had divided the classroom into two groups. And so she taught one group while her supervisor watched her, and I was teaching the other one. And so when she left, um, I asked the kids, I'm like, so how, how did she do? And they were like, oh, she was great. And then one of the kids said, but I think she was a little bit nicer today than she usually is. And so we all kind of laughed, and I said, do I do that? Like, when the principal is in here evaluating me, am I nicer? And 
the kids said, no, no, no. And then one student who was in my group, and I will tell you, the group I taught had been the weekly kids who have trouble sitting still and paying attention. And one of the students in my group said, no, but you smile more with the other group anyway. And I'm going to tell you, that hit my heart like a ton of bricks. Um, but I thought, man, that's their perception. That's what they think. And that motivated me to change everything I did in my classroom. So I think surrounding yourself and really seeking out those teachers who maybe you want to be like, maybe there's a part of them that you really admire, and then really listening to your students, even when it's a hard message you're hearing, those are a couple of really important ways that I think teachers can stay motivated. You've mentioned some things that have changed about education. What is still true about this work? You know, when we go back to the word crisis, which I think could probably be a really good description of what we've gone over the past few years, the Greek root of that means to sift. And so we think about what has sifted through, what is still true about our profession. I think one thing is it is absolutely beautiful work. Um, I think when I when I talk with teachers and we talk about like, what's that moment in your classroom? I call it the sweet spot where they're talking, the students are talking, and you can almost literally take some steps away and you know it's gonna keep going amongst them and you're like, my work here is done, <laughs> right? That's that sweet spot. I think it's just such beautiful work and we still see that. It's hopeful work. And I think that hopefulness that's inherent in we are impacting the generation that has the potential to solve all of our problems. And we may not be here to see it, but that hopefulness that's behind it that we are building the pyramids that are gonna outlast us, I think is another thing that's still really true. And I think it's hard work in all the best ways. A lot of times when we talk about the hard work, it feels like a struggle or it's onerous. But you know, we do hard work because it's um, it's challenging and it's fulfilling. And when we even look at like what we're asking our students to do at the end of the year, and that is some tough work, but it's gonna set them up for lifelong success. Um, I think people tend to gravitate toward hard work. Our kids love it. They don't wanna do things that are, that are easy. They wanna do things that are hard, right? Because they want to know, I too am capable of great challenge. So I think those are three things that, that maybe help us see more than ever that these are the things that are true about the teaching profession and it's why we keep doing this really great work. Okay, Kathy, before we move on, is there a parting message that you would like to share with the teachers who are watching? Oh, I think I would tell them, particularly after the, these last two years, when it's really maybe restructured a lot of how we work, um, question everything. I think it's a fantastic time to question, what are my practices that I'm using? Are they effective? Should I keep them? Should I not? I think question everything. And I think my second point would be to find the joy. Um, once a month, I try to interview a teacher in our district who um, who I know I can learn from and maybe I can scale out what I learned from them. And one of our third grade teachers said, you know, there is such a sense of urgency to fill the day. And there are times as a teacher, it's okay to just sit and enjoy the joy of the moment and what it means to be with eight-year-olds or 12-year-olds or 17-year-olds all day and all that they are learning and all that they're becoming. So question everything and lean into that joy. Dr. Presnell, you've joined today to kick off Quaver Ed's first PLC. Would you tell me a little bit about how your district does PLC? We think about it through what we're calling the prepare to teach cycle um, because we are using high quality instructional materials in literacy and in math. And so they, they really ask us to kind of shift our thinking about not only what do we do in the classroom, but also as teachers, how do we prepare to use those materials? So we, we use the PLC time to, first of all, start off understanding the unit. So do I know at a high level, what is it my kids are learning and what's the type of thinking that this unit of study is demanding of them? And then my favorite teacher nerdy thing we do is we take the assessment ourselves. So we call it eating the chicken nuggets before we feed them to the kids, right? So we actually sit, we take the assessments ourselves without looking at the answer keys. And we think about what are the instructional moves we can make to help move kids toward the right answer? And what might they choose as a wrong answer that helps us know what, what misconceptions do we need to head off in the classroom? Then we internalize and sometimes rehearse lessons together. And particularly for a, a teacher who's maybe early in his or her career, that helps them like work through sticky spots in a lesson and get pacing down and lean into the, the knowledge of our veteran teachers. 
And then we have a part of the cycle that we call teach and reflect. And we like to not only maybe look at student work or student data or analyze a piece of student writing, but also look at our own craft. What data are we capturing about my instructional moves and how is that contributing to our student's success? So it's this really ongoing cycle of how do we surface up above the materials and understand them, practice them deeply, and then reflect on what impact is it having on our kids in the classroom. That's how we like to think about uh, PLC work in our district. Great. It sounds like incredible growth opportunity for your teachers. As our final question today, will you please share with the teachers watching, what do you do for your own professional learning? And also, will you tell us what your favorite book is? Oh, absolutely. So um, I'm going to get a little teacher nerdy for a second because when I think about my own learning, every year I devise my own learning plan. So I know like this year, these are the things I want to learn and I make sure I curate them throughout the year. But a couple of things I do is I have trusted folks that I turn to over and over and over um, that their their work is grounded in solid research. And I just try to read and study and take all the webinars. I make sure I've always got a professional book going. And, um, and I also write, and it's a discipline that I've been trying to press myself into a little bit more this year, but I'm finding that as I go and I read and I learn, if I come back and I write about it myself, um, it just really helps me kind of internalize it better and think about how it actually needs to shift my own thinking. So um, who knows, there might be a book coming out soon. <laughs> um, but then when I think about my favorite books, I'm going to talk in my three favorite categories. So if I think just adult literature, East of Eden, hands down, I would argue it's the great American novel. So I don't know if, if you're up for that maybe later on, but we can argue <laughs> what's the great American novel. But East of Eden, I think, has it all. Um, when I think about professional, um, I'm currently reading Reading Reconsidered by Doug Lamoff. Really good, digging into like some older uh, kids reading and how we can help them. And then if we're talking about children's literature, um, The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane by Kate DiCamillo, hands down, favorite read, if you read it to your children or your students, what you must do is make sure you can read the entire last chapter in full without stopping. So you want to make sure you got a good 15 to 20 minutes of time. But if you do it in the classroom, it's not until the last line that everything falls into place and you'll hear the whispers across the classroom as the kids go, oh, it's just teacher magic. So my three favorite books. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. Dr. Presnell, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to have you here with us. On behalf of Quaver Ed, thank you for the work that you are doing each day. You are definitely making a difference in the lives of children. Thank you, it's been a privilege. And thank you all for tuning in for this conversation. Be sure to continue engaging in the PLC as we unpack their learning from this discussion and consider application for ourselves and our students. Be sure to check out quavered.com to learn more. Thank you. Thank you.